I mean, do take a seat and we'll refer back to you if we may. Um, let, let's widen it out. We only have 10 minutes or so before we have to chase away. Um, I think I mentioned previously uh, that uh, Nick had given me some questions to ask. But before I get to them, is there any comment that people want to make, anything they want to add to the Gentor font of knowledge before we go down any particular avenue? It's your last, last opportunity as a group. Not your last opportunity. Yes, sir. You certainly get plenty of exercise, Nick, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the last presentation had uh, all these key success uh, areas which were highlighted. One of those that I think Nick Friggins did not mention, which I think is very important actually, and came out in the first three presentations, is capacity building. Uh, I think this uh, project has demonstrated that you, you can actually train people as they are doing research. Now, given what we've just heard from our panel farmer of some capacity building that happens on the farm and also on the shows, how do we reconcile this? The formal learning in school, uni, and what goes on at, on the farm and also in the shows? That's not just for our presenter. Anybody want to comment on that? Are we so far... Well, I could ask Claudia. She's closest. But I suppose. Sorry, frivolous answer. I meant uh, you should sack the uh, lecturer who told uh, Herman to select such angular cows. But is that correct? I mean, maybe in the future we'll be uh, rotating around again in terms of our knowledge. I don't know. So that's education. Any other comments? Nick? Just, just to respond a little bit. This is something we struggle with. And so we've done a research project. We've tried to involve stakeholders. But we've really struggled to get down to the farmer level. We've had some stakeholder interviews, we've had uh, panels with farmers, we've had vets and so on. But we do have this kind of layered system where the researchers talk to the advisors, the advisors talk with the industry, the industry talk with the reps, da 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 da, da. And it's difficult to get all of those things into, into one place. It would be extremely useful to make that mix, but we certainly, we tried and I would say failed. We, 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 we've done what we could, but, but we, those are different projects. Perhaps the bovine has a different experience with their, with their network. That, that, that would be an interesting comment. Is Virginia prepared to say anything? You clearly have engaged, I'll come back to you, Jonathan, with farmers at a much more significant level than we managed. Well, uh, this specifically, uh, this is about um, dairy. So it, our, our network is about beef, but I think that similar things can happen. And, and that's why I believe that we had to work together and listen, listen ourselves uh, to avoid this, this, the things to happen. And maybe this is something interesting also for, for countries that maybe are less developed or have worked le uh, less, not to, to repeat some mistakes Thank you, Mike. And um, I want to say thank you to Herman, first of all, as well, because I think it's so important at this stage of the project that actually we go back to actually a farmer, a breeder, and what this is all about. And I think Virginia's project shows that really well, too. I think partial success, Nick, I would say, rather than failure, because I think it is really important for all of us with any research to take responsibility for sharing the results and making sure there's an impact. And I think the Gentle Project has done that. Um, I think we can do more. Um, but what's interested me is actually every conversation that we have that involves farmers, and I'm a vet in practice, that changes what we do at a time of great need, a time of such disruption, I think we do have to do better. And every bit of research that we do, we have to make sure that people hear it 
Otherwise, it is not as valuable as we think it is. I think one of the things I feel actually most proud of, though, is that throughout the project we have in different stages, and every person that's listened is a convert and is a new thinker. And um, at the, uh, the workshops we ran at the Precision Livestock Farm Meeting in November in, in York sat around the conference table. There were farmers, there were vets, there were agric students, there were breeders, there were government um, influences, and the conversations that happened, they may have been small, but they were important. So I do think what we've done is, is valuable, but we can definitely do more. Um, yep. Yeah. And then what I'd like to do is to ask the three young presenters at the beginning for their view on how we might do better. I just think that there's been so many important and good tools which have been developed develop here, so so that we need to, and it's our, we have to go back, each of us uh, in each country, and also try to tell all the organisations because what have been made here, because there's so much which uh, now I'm from Denmark, I know this can, this can really be used, and we have some projects which could be, where it could be used into these projects. So I think we should try to encourage ourselves to at least go to the organizations and say, here's something that you should take up. And eventually, in many of our countries, have a national meetings where we could say, could we wrap up on what has been done here? Because there has been done so much important. Uh, Nick, I think that's really valuable for, for, for the industries around the, the European countries. So not to miss it. So I think we should do this within the next year. Harriet, can I come to you first for a view? Uh, and I only pick on these people um, because they're available. I'm just trying to think of something to add, really. I, I guess in future projects, and this is something that I think we did do within Gentor, is involving um, farmers at every stage of the process, um, not just at the dissemination at the end, but at the beginning when deciding what to do. And yeah, I think that that makes the results that much more applicable. We're not researching something that isn't actually an important issue. Can I ask, do you think we should have got them in at the design stage, which perhaps would be 18 months before the project launched or was even applied for? Yeah. I mean, is that, is that even realistic? I know, I know we got them in quite early on, right? There, there, was de there were definitely interviews and things early on, but in designing the project, potentially. think we can get farmers involved in design or or is it always going to be driven by researchers I was just going to add a slightly different perspective on that idea of bringing farmers into project design because that's exactly what medical research is doing so I'm a consumer representative for a hospital in Australia and I'm involved and in the design of research projects so if other um, other areas of science can do it, why can't we? And in terms of a long-term view for fostering better connections between the wider farming community and researchers, one of the things that I've seen work quite well is pairing PhD, PhD students with mentors from the wider farming community so that if they don't come from a farming background themselves, they have that opportunity during their studies to get that wider perspective. And that's something that you can start at the undergrad level and continue right through. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm going to go to Alban first, Jonathan, as I come round, if that's OK, and see whether he's got a view. So um, from my perspective, what I've learned from Gentor, um, it is how powerful it is to combine different disciplines. So I am a geneticist, and I had to work with nutritionists, physiologists, and it's not always very easy, but I guess at the end of the day, uh, I've learned a lot, and this makes also great contributions, so I don't know if it answers directly your question, but um, it was one of the good points, and I think it's one of the good points to, to keep for other future projects. No, 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 thank you very much, that's a really interesting point. Um, Jonathan, and then Emma, if you want to add to your work. Thanks, Mike. 
working with nutritionists is particularly difficult, isn't it? I think we should make that, we should make that point. <laughs> <laughs> or, or one nutritionist is difficult anyway. Um, I think um, the interdisciplinary thing is really is really great, isn't it? It's important. But I want to pick up the point about um, farmer involvement because um, there's, there's some formats of research. So at the moment, we're involved in some research starter work where it has to involve a farmer leading the research and they have to have at least 50% of the grant going directly to them. And they, it's, it's a phase which designs larger research programs, but it means the farmers actually, and the initial application is, is in video format, with farmers recording just basically video um, around half a dozen questions, but they have to do the videos, and they have to be involved. And it's just a very disruptive way of thinking about starting projects that can then lead to bigger programs, but they're farmer started, and they get paid. Right. I don't know whether you've got a comment, Emre. Well, I don't know what to say, but uh, um, I think Genta was a, was a good bridge between the science and industry. At least that's how I feel from the uh, Danish side, because some of the at least uh, some of the tools and knowledge that we gain from Genta project, we already have have them in pipelines to implement in in in, in Denmark. So it's been very useful. And uh, of course, it opened up new questions, like uh, Mike mentioned in the earlier sessions, that there are still things that we can improve in these model models and methods. But uh, I don't think you are considering another gentle project. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, do we need a project on identifying farmer stakeholders? Um, I just wanted to ask you a question about your consumer committees. Is that something that was is sort of set up as a standing initiative which sits there with the hospital and then when projects come along you feed in or was it set up specifically in relation to particular projects? The hospital that I'm involved in has a dedicated um, s staff that work to involve consumers or patients throughout all aspects of hospital life. So there's a regular newsletter that comes out with different research projects or um, consulting, you know, patient feedback um, opportunities. So there's a variety of, I guess, techniques that the hospital uses to get patient feedback. One of the projects that I was part of the early scoping interviews. The total direction that the lead investigator thought they were going to take with the project went 180 degrees after she did the initial scoping interviews with the project. Yeah, so. OK. Um, what about the gaps of people identified uh, knowledge that we ought to seek and don't have? Do people have opinions on? that or is it just a continuation of the work that you've been doing? Uh, Eileen's put her hand up and I particularly wanted to comment that you broadened it right at the beginning of your presentation which a lot of people picked up and I think that was quite useful um, and you could throw small ruminants into what you found out because that's where a lot of meat production is in the world. Not those woolly yolks. Okay. Uh, sheep meat is the only red meat that is going to increase around the globe, and, go and goat too. Um, I was wondering, uh, not, not because Joe just said it, but what about final consumers of the products, or the ones that are choosing not to consume the products? But I probably think, as Mizek far more eloquently said, crossover about how these tools translate practically, because they, they might not work, because completely different systems, more diverse genetics, etc., 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 you know, I think really the extension into outside of European developed, in the worst sense of the word, agriculture is probably more important. But I do think we need to listen to consumers because they're going to drive what the um, FAO tells us in 10 years' time. Yes, uh, famously the um, was it Meat Institute in Bristol used to have taste panels, so they did actually have that sort of structure. Um, just interesting from the production, from the... Um, Structures that we've been shown, even for new projects, that dissemination comes at the bottom. Is is that the right focus? Maybe we should be turning it on its head in that respect. 
Anybody else? Yes. Uh, uh, I would have thought that in terms of uh, threats to the ruminant uh, production industries, methane production is just vastly more important than everything else. Um, the, the societies and governments will close us down completely by 2050 if they really want to achieve net zero. And there was a little bit about methane, but in a, if you look at the importance of it, it should have dominated the meeting instead of being a very small part. I, I should ask Herman, do you get paid for selection against methane for your cattle? Well, don't get me started on the CO2 and methane <laughs> discussions in ruminants. But uh, um, no, I, I was thinking about the, uh, the gaps you were mentioning uh, one question before. Are we missing a gap in our knowledge or in our implementation of it? I think I think one important thing we're missing is the implementability of the knowledge we're gaining here because there is a very important step between you and the breeders or the farmers, and that is... AI or organization or AI stations calling themselves breeding organizations today and interfering with uh, uh, our decision. They decide which bulls we use. Now, not me, because we're stubborn enough to use our own bulls, but most farmers uh, pick the bulls from the ranking from their AI stations. And we don't have a lot of influence on them because they are the commercial lead. In Holland, I can speak for Holland, the largest and most commercial AI semen selling organization, Holland Genetics, took over the national herd book, you won't believe it, but they did 25 years ago, and changed it into CR Delta. So from that time on, a commercial organization was able to make all the rankings, all the breeding, breeding value estimations from all the bulls, not only from their own, but from all their competitors as well. That has been the wrong structure and uh, still blocking a lot of improvement coming from science to the breeders. I think that's a gap or, or a, an obstacle we have. Uh, uh, well, how to, I try to put it in these little uh, uh, pictures that um, how can we uh, yeah, get good knowledge about efficiency and resilience into the rankings of the bulls that are actually being used because today we're using bulls like the ones I showed you on the picture. Uh, uh, resilient or not. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Was there a question here? Yes. I had two questions for you. Uh, so how do you compare in your scheme here, how do you compare the animals between uh, be between farms and so to, in order to get uh, from my point of view, a, a fair uh, use of the bulls, of the AI bulls of the different farmers. And the second question, so what is the size of your farm and how do you manage the genetic div diversity? Yeah. Uh, we have a size of about 50 dairy cows, always had, and that's, and that's uh, more than enough to maintain uh, 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 the diversity, because we have bred with it for 50 years and only bred with our own bulls. We have been genetically closed farm, so to speak. We only use uh, five bulls every year, at least five, from our best cows, and they served the herd the next year. Not the closest matings, but of course everything is family. It's a line bred population in our barn. Everything's line bred, of course. But that's no problem for 50 years. We never get calves with two tails or two heads or uh, not at least not more than in the Holstein population. Luckily we never had, but talking about inbreeding, eh, we can also, don't get me started about the Holstein breed today, uh, <coughs> talking about inbreeding. And the other one here is then, uh, the idea is like the pig breeding, in the, in the pig breeding it's already been established this way, you have the top breeders breeding top lines, A lines, B lines, C lines, only using their own boars. Eh? So, these farmers, these breeders should use their own bulls and, and establish a line within the breed. And then that semen should be distributed. And these farmers decide, these breeders decide which are their best bulls. 
I know which bulls are my best bulls and which cows are my best cows. I don't need a model to tell me which cow in my barn is the highest or the best. I know which ones are. So let the breeders decide which bulls go to the AI and then let users eh, or farmers that don't uh, uh, love breeding as much as we do and just want to have a, a group of resilient and efficient cows, they can use oh, different bulls from A, B, C, D lines and, uh, and continue uh, breeding within a breed without inbreeding and, uh, and having resilient and efficient cows. That's the idea. Thank you. Well, time moves on. Um, so I think we should conclude and we should give the microphone back to Nick. Um, but before we do that, I don't know whether anybody was going to thank him for leading us for the past five years. Um, I'm probably one of the older members in the audience. So as a senior, purely by age, um, on your behalf, I'd like very much to say um, thank you. Um, it's been um, an interesting task, a challenging task in challenging times. Uh, and yet we have got to the end with, I think, a lot of useful information that clearly we think we need to transmit better to others, particularly farmers and end users. But having said that, I think he's led us with great good humor, uh, fair balance throughout. Um, we're a diverse and argumentative lot. Um, we don't always agree, um, but as a good leader should do, he's got us there as a coordinated group um, and as a team. So if we were in the uh, Dutch first division, we would be up there with Feyenoord, um, maybe not um, at the top, but certainly not at the bottom uh, like Sparta. Okay, I hand you over and a round of applause, I think is well due. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Mike. So we're near the end. Thank you, Harman, for your views. I'm sure there are people who don't agree with everything. But what I take away is that you're very interested in having resilient and efficient cows. I think we actually agree on what some of the things to do with resilience are. The body, the reserves and everything. Um, then we can discuss over a beer how we actually get there. <coughs> okay. So, there's a talk called Gentle End. Here we go. Mm -hmm.